Hello, everybody. Right, excellent. Okay, guys, so listen up, and I'll just quickly introduce um, John uh, for you. So, um, welcome, John Aitchison. Um, John is uh, an award winning uh, wildlife photographer and uh, cameraman, uh, does a lot of work for the BBC, um, lots of programs like uh, Dynasties, Frozen Planet, Planet Earth, etc. And um, I won't embarrass you, John, too much by saying you are a double BAFTA and Emmy award winning uh, mm. camera person. So, uh, welcome to Geography, and it's 1B uh, that we have in front of you today. Um, so we'd like to um, ask you just a few questions about your filming and your role, not just as um, a camera person, but maybe a geographer, a wildlife specialist as well. Um, so the first uh, question just for me linked to the work that we've been doing in geography is what's it like, or the logistics of what it's like working in a cold desert environment uh, like the Arctic tundra? Would you be able to give us a quick insight into what it's uh, like um, training? Yeah. Sure. Um, well, I, I worked in Svalbard and in Arctic Canada, um, and actually this year I'm going to Arctic Russia as well. The main thing, of course, is that it's quite cold much of the time, so you need quite a lot of protection from the cold, which could be thick boots and gloves and down coats, really thick coats. Um, on the other hand, it doesn't get dark in the summer, so it can be quite hot as well if the weather is settled. So you can get this weird situation where um, there's ice under the ground, permafrost, not very far under the soil, but you can actually be swelteringly hot, and then a cold wind will blow in from somewhere else from the north, especially it becomes extremely cold really quickly. So you have to be prepared for almost anything, really. Um, in the past, it didn't used to rain there very much, but even that's changing now, and there are storms, quite big Arctic storms these days, since the climate's warming. Um, the other thing is, of course, there are polar bears. Um, which you don't get in the Antarctic. So on the land in the Antarctic, you're pretty safe and you can wander around. But in the Arctic, you have to always be conscious that there might be a, an extremely large predator coming up behind you trying to, um, trying to eat you. So uh, you have to be wary about that. Okay. No, thanks for that. That's, that's great. Um, yeah, links in with what we're doing. Um, so what I'm going to do, I'm just going to sort of randomly draw out some questions. That okay. Day, and uh, pass them to those uh, people that, that wish to ask them. Um, so first out is um, Jack. Um, there you go, you're lucky to be the first one. Would you just like to read it out? Just stay where you are, just a big loud voice. Um, Hi, Jack. Have you ever had a near-death experience while filming? Um, well, a good question, I, I, I always have the word getting into it. Um, we're usually pretty cool, so I do it through a very good one. Kind of like in case looking at the um, nothing I would say apart from calm on road, uh, which has been quite that bad, but in times when COVID uh, left me, or the lion gone very close, um, particularly a lion that was trying to climb into the car that I was in the and um, has moved the car out of the way it's during the density so much. And she got very used to our car and she'd come and stick her head inside it through the door, which, which was completely missing the door. We had to take the door off the camera. So um, that's, that's as bad as it's got so far. <laughs> I don't think it's any uh, pleasant than that. Thank you. Okay, uh, that's great. Right, next one I've drawn is uh, Katie's. Okay. If you could have any animal that you filmed as a pet, what would it be? <laughs> Probably be an otter, I think. They're my favourite animal. Um, of course, we have them in Scotland and I live by the sea, so um, we have otters quite nearby in our island. And uh, I think that would be my choice because they're the most playful of, of all the mammals in this country, at least, and pretty much anywhere. And I think they, um, apart from the fact that most people who've had otters as pets, as pets, they're missing a finger usually because the otters are bitten their fingers off. Um, apart from that, they're really good at pets. It's probably not a great qualification for a pet, but yeah, I'm not. Um, right, thank you, John. Uh, next uh, question is uh, Madison's. Um, How does it feel when you see animals bonding and capturing the moments? Uh, sorry, did you say that again? How does it feel? How does it feel when you see animals bonding and you capture the moment on camera? When you see them bonding, bonding as in like yes. family, like 
family things. Ah, oh, yeah. Um, well, that's in many ways it's the best. It's the best thing to film, I think, because there was a time when when our programs were pushed toward being dramatic all the time, and what that usually meant was they wanted hunting. Um, and it was partly because at that time American television was paying some cost of making the programs and they thought their audience wanted to see lots of exciting hunts. But actually, I think the more interesting things that animals do are not hunting, um, and it only takes up a small part of their lives anyway. But what is interesting is how they socialize, how they react to each other and to the other species around them too. So those things, like, like with the lions actually in the dynasties, program that was on before Christmas, that aspect of their lives is really fascinating and, and it's very subtle and you see how some are much more the leader of the group and they kept the others and others are learning and joining in and becoming more skilled as time goes by. It's, it's the best, most enthralling thing to be involved in really. And, and actually it's something we can, you know, we can all experience, even with pets, you know, because you see that sort of process going on all the time, but you, with animals that you know about. Okay, thank you. Um, right, next uh, question is from Harry. Uh, John, there we go. Hi, Harry. Hello. Um, <laughs> <laughs> What's the strangest thing you've seen while travelling? Um, that's a good question and quite difficult to answer. Um, there are lots of strange things, I suppose. Um, one of the funniest ones, it wasn't a natural history thing really, but I once saw a bus in, I'll tell you about the history one well in a minute, but I once saw a bus in Nairobi, which was absolutely full, filled with people right to the, to the ceiling and the roof of the bus, actually covering people. And there they paint the names of, or they paint sort of slogan or men on a vehicle. So this bus was called Matai Warrior, but it wasn't spelled like you think, like a W A E. Warrior, it was more W O R I E R, a really worrying Maasai is, but that was quite funny. But um, I think the strangest thing, usually when something unexpected, when you are, when you think you know what's going to happen, and then what actually happens is, is a surprise. So, um, well, one example is not an object example, I'm afraid, but um, when we were filming the the lion, they. The whole family of lions suddenly decided they wanted to chase a rhinoceros. And, and no way that they could catch a rhinoceros. I mean, they're huge rhinos and they have big horns. But the lions, even the crops, were trying to sort of nip its heels. And um, the, the rhinoceros kept sort of jogging along, running away, and turning around and going to score on the lions. But it was, it was a strange thing, but not for ages. We don't know what we were doing, really. Um, but that was, that was pretty unusual. Okay, thanks. Yeah. That's great. Um, okay, next question is uh, Kirsten here. Um, just come all the way up. I got this side. There you go. Hi. Um, so, on a scale of one to ten, um, like, how scared are you? Like before, like after the day, like when you like go to sleep, and then like, are you scared that you'll get fit or something? Or um, it depends what you're saying, I suppose. And sometimes. Um, whereas today it's a very safe place and sometimes it can be a bit scary. Um, the tents, we, we were playing in tents in Kenya and there were there was some very loud noises outside. And the loudest noise was an elephant snoring, because the elephant would come up and was leaning on the tent by my head. The tent would be in like this and I had this elephant snoring next to my head. And it around all the last as well. But um, they're quite safe, the elephants there, if you're, if you're not frightening them, they're not frightening you, really. But, um, Polar bears are quite frightening. They, they, if you're keeping on the land, you've got to be very careful about the bears. There was a funny story about this because there was a man, a Norwegian called Bjorna, uh, Bjorn, Bjorn is his surname, Professor Bjorn, uh, which means bear in Norwegian. And he'd gone on an expedition with some other people in Svalbard, which is part of Norway, in the Arctic, an island. And they would camp all night and they put out some. Trip wires with explosives to scare away the bears or to wake them up with a night time if they were asleep when the bear came past. It would trip the thing and the bangers would go off. So they all jump out at that point. And Professor Bjorn, in the middle of the night, decided he needed to go out for a pee. So he left the tent quietly and he stepped over the trip wire and he walked away. And when he came back, he tripped over the wire and set all the bangers off. 
And all the people in the tent jumped up thinking it was a bear, and they couldn't see because they were in the tent, so they were running around trying to get out in a hurry. And he didn't make things any better by shouting, it's Bjorn, Bjorn, meaning it's a bear, as far as they were concerned. He was just saying his name, but it didn't help. Brilliant. Okay. Yeah, that's, that's a dangerous one, isn't it? Um, yeah. Okay, next uh, question, Aaron. Um, there you go. What is the most dangerous situation you've been in, and how did you get out of it? Um, well, the most, it's hard to know what the most dangerous situations are because I'm still here, so they didn't develop into being any more dangerous than, um, than they may have seemed at the time. So what, what usually happens is that you're with someone else who's responsible for safety. So the bears were the polar bears, which were quite dangerous. The, the people I was with decided when they should scare the bears away. There, there were a couple of times when the bears just kept coming closer and closer. And the person, name that his name is, would, would, would fire a banger and chase the bear off, usually. But the end of one of all, I think, was when I was in a hide. So I had to, to go inside a, like a tent to film from sometimes, so the birds can't see me if I'm filming birds. They usually um, are quite worried about being a person. So we had this little tent um, to film an eider duck on its nest. So they put me in the tent and they left these other people and they sat up on a hill with a radio. And I had a radio. And after a while they said, um, quick, quick, you've got to come out because there's a bear coming. Hold it. But they came down and they helped me get the camera. We left the tent up behind, went away to a building that we'd been staying in and looked back at what was happening. And the bear came up to the hut and it stuck its head in the back where the zip is, which would be exactly where my backside would be if I was sitting inside it on a stool. It, it put its whole head inside and then it looked around and then it went around the front and it stood up on its hind legs and it just pushed the hide, completely flattened it. Um, so staying in there, oh, that would have been exciting if you could still inside, wouldn't it? Because the bear, the bear was really quiet, it just came from behind and it just kind of stuck its head in. I don't know if you have full of heads of your beard, how do you lay? So that, that was a bit um, frightening. Uh, there were also hyenas, I've come hyenas in Ethiopia a few years back for um, Planet Earth 2. And um, normally hyenas are quite frightening, they're quite dangerous at night. But in the town where we filmed them in Ethiopia, they were extremely tame. And one of those came up and sniffed my hand and bumped against it while I was filming, leaving to hold the tripod, which is a bit behind you. And then there this bump, and I thought it was a person who bumped into me. And I don't know, and the hyena was just, just there looking at me. And it was fine, I just had a little sniff and looked away. Not very good. Probably. Thank you, John. Um, okay, next question is from Jenny. Um, there we go. Okay. Hello. Um, are you working on any interesting projects? Right. Um, that, there are three things coming up in October. Um, one's a, a film at the cinema, which I think will be shown in America first, but it will eventually come here. It's, it's a children's film. It might be a bit younger than, than you guys. It's um, about penguins, so it's a nature film made by Disney, film, not an animation, a film, uh, you know, actually a documentary film. Um, it's just called Penguins, I think. That'll be out in April in the States, and I suppose it's quite been on here. And then there's a National Geographic series called Hostile Planet, starting in April as well, National Geographic channel. And there's a Netflix series called Our Planet, also starting in April. And I think Our Planet's going to be really, really good, so... I recommend watching that one. It's um, a film in Mongolia and Russia for them, and Panama in uh, South America. The wild horses and um, things called saiga antelopes on the tundra, not the tundra, the um, steppe, grassland. So the, yeah, those are all coming in April. There's a bit of a sudden splurge. Hey, that's great. Thanks, John. Thank you. Um, Okay, um, oh, there's one here without a name on it. I don't know who's quick. I'll just read this for quickness, but I don't know whose this is. Um, it's a good question, though. Um, has an animal ever reacted reacted negatively, sorry, uh, to your presence? Um, yeah. You've mentioned a, really a couple, I think, already, but is there anything that uh, jumps out? Exactly. Well, it's, a good, it's actually a really important question because, of course, we don't want animals to react negatively to our presence when we're filming. Uh, other, well, for one thing, it would be morally wrong anyway, wouldn't it, to go and scare something when it's trying to get on with its life. And all you're doing is making a television program. 
And the other reason is that um, it wouldn't be behaving normally if it was frightened. So, of course, that's not what you want to film anyway. So there are good reasons not to frighten um, or change the behaviour of animals. Um, so we, we go to a lot of trouble not to have that happen. So, for instance, with the hides, when we're filming from hide, when I'm filming from hide, it's very small. It's only a square metre footprint of it, and it's a bit taller than that. Uh, so I disappear into that for, for the whole day, maybe 12, maybe 17 hours inside this little tent. And um, in order that the animals think I'm not there, someone else has to walk with me to the hide and get me in and hand in the camera, and then they leave. And the animals that are watching see someone leaving again and think everything's fine and all the people have gone. And the tent is not of any interest to them at all. They get used to it quite quickly. So you can just use those, but you have to put them up at a distance to start with and then move them closer slowly. Um, otherwise, even the tent itself, the hide, can be a bit of a surprise and that might frighten, scare, scare animals, easily scare animals. But some animals, are, they don't mind at all. The um, albatrosses, which, which almost never see people because they're at sea all the time, when they're nesting, um, they were actually, I was in their way a little bit and they would come up and nudge me and try and get me out of the way. So I'd then move back again and they'd carry on with what they were doing. In fact, there was one making a nest where I could hand it moss and it would take it from my hand and put it into its nest. I was collecting moss for it and passing it over and the albatross would take it and tuck it into its nest on both sides. So sometimes they're um, reacting in a, in a positive way like that, which is lovely. But, you know, most animals in this country think people are in fright, so they react as though we're a frightening thing and we have to be very cautious about that. Okay, that's that's great. Um, right, next question. Uh, oh, it's Callum. Um, oh, sorry. Hi, Callum. Okay. There we go. Um, how long does it take to film one scene of one animal? Yeah, that's a good question. That depends on the program a little bit. And you could, I suppose, the shortest time is if you kept the camera running continuously, that the thing you wanted to have happen happened in. Five minutes, it would take five minutes. But that would be like a live program, that's exactly what would happen. You'd have your camera running and it would just be, you know, you get what you get. But with programs where the behavior is edited and where you might collect a long period of time, um, it takes maybe about a month uh, to film four or five minutes of the week. So uh, an hour long program. Um, has you can you know, you kind of work it out by you it can be maybe twelve months worth of filming, perhaps more. The Lion Dynasty film was four hundred and forty days of filming for an hour for an hour. So it's a long time. Yeah. So you're, you're away from home a long time, aren't you then? Oh, yes, yeah, I'm away for hundred and eighty days a year. Wow. Unless I'm filming at home. If I'm filming otters, I'm at home for 180 days a year filming. I haven't done that for a little while. That's great. That's why we appreciate you being able to do this today. <laughs> so is it okay just to have a few more questions? Could we squeeze some in, perhaps? Is that okay? I can't hear. Okay. Um, oh, Sophie, next question. I think it's frozen. Is it frozen? Can you hear, John? Yeah, I can still hear you. Oh, that's yeah. fine. Sorry. Um, yeah, we just had a bit of a, a lull there. Um, That's right. Yeah, okay. I'm uh, sorry, I was just going to say, um, yeah, we appreciate you being able to do this then, considering how busy oh, no, you are. Good. No, so, it's a pleasure. No, it's my problem. I'm pleased to be able to do it. I, I, did, I studied geography myself, so I'm, I'm keen on geographers. So That's I think it. you're doing the right you're subject. In, you're in good company then. There you go. It's a nice plug for us there. Thank you. <laughs> okay, um, so next, um, I've got a question from Sophie. Um, oh, you're right there. Sorry, Sophie. Oh, you. I was looking around for a second. I realised. Oh, I'm in my picture. <laughs> Oh, you want to move over? Can you see Sophie? Yes, I can. Oh, right, oh, that's Hi, so um, what is the weather conditions like while, fi like, while, while you're filming? Like, the footage? Is it like, hard to film? Yeah, it's a good question because that's changing, of course, because um, the climate's changing and climate affects the weather. So, in, in many places, what was normal for weather is no longer normal. I mean, in fact, you've probably heard about this typhoon that's just hit um, at the southeast corner of Africa in Mozambique and Mar Malawi and um, Zimbabwe. Just a tremendous storm that's hit there, and that's not normal. You know, that would have been, I think, it's unprecedented how bad it is. 
So as you warm the atmosphere, of course, and you warm the ocean, you're going to get much more um, powerful storms and more frequently. And it affects us here as well. It already is affecting us here as well. So sometimes um, you go expecting one set of conditions, and it's actually quite different. Um, it, for instance, in, um, in Zambia, a couple of years back, um, it rains there every year, um, late in the December of September time. Very, very heavy rain. Um, we were expecting that it would start raining while we were there, and it becomes incredibly hot and dry before, before it rains. And it just didn't, it didn't rain, it didn't rain, it didn't rain. We, were, we weren't going to film the rain, but we didn't think it would come while we were there. And, and it didn't, it stayed incredibly hot. So that's an example of needing to be prepared for pretty much anything. But in South Georgia, just last month, um, it was extremely wet there this year, and the wind was very strong. Um, and they were saying there that they hadn't, because there's a British Antarctic survey base on South Georgia, and they keep weather records. And they've been there 60 years, and they were saying it's one of the worst summers they've had in, in that time, in terms of windiness and wetness, which is really bad for the birds, and for the albatrosses and things that are nesting there, because the chip that love here, they get left behind when they're out, apparently. They get very bedraggled and wet and cold, uh, as do penguin chips even. If it rains, they're not really used to rain. So yeah, it means that you've got to get ready for everything, and so the animals, and as time is changing, some are just not that Thank you. Okay, thanks. Uh, right, next question is uh, Amy's. Um, Angel. Sorry, I'm taking too long to this coming. Yeah. 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 Favourite place? Yeah. Um, I love Scotland. Uh, I love Scotland, so that's, I suppose it is my favourite place actually, but especially the West Coast. But my favourite place for filming that I've ever been was um, filming Emperor Penguins in the Antarctic, where we had to camp on the sea. So the, the sea is frozen, of course, and um, we set up a tent on, on the ice with 300 meters of water underneath us. And um, when we were camping, we had to then go on a skidoo each day to where the penguins were, jumping in and out of the water. But when we were actually in a tent, you could hear seals, called um, weddle seals, singing underneath the tent and the, in the water, and the sound would come up through the ice, and you could hear it because your head was resting on the sleeping bag, which was on top of the snow, which was on top of the ice, which was on top of the sea. And they have these extraordinary sounds, they sound kind of like a video game. <laughs> Right, that amazing fact, buzzing and updating. In fact, if you look it up on the internet, um, just a couple of sound that's made by the seals, it's W E double E P double L, where he was a person, and you'll be amazed that it's an app. I saw a clip the other day of one sleeping and it was making the hands in its feet, lying on the ice. You couldn't hardly believe it was a seal, it was an extraordinary sound. Yeah, so I loved it there. It was very cold and dangerous, but it was really exciting because we were living with the penguins and they kept coming over and hanging out with us. It was great. Thank you. That's, that's great. That's great. Um, thanks, John. I think we've just got time for one more. Um, okay. So um, I've just drawn out a question that was actually quite similar to one you answered. So our last question um, is from um, Angus. Um, Hi, Angus. Sorry, everybody else, if you've asked them. I know, um, yeah, it's, it's a shame. We've got a couple of uh, people who's missing uh, absent today as well. So, um, yeah. but, uh, thanks for your time again. Thank you. That's all right. Uh, so, what was the best feel good moment of your career? Yeah, um, well, it would always feel very good when you've succeeded in becoming something difficult. But um, my, my favourite thing of all was I, I made a film with David Attenborough about Amber. Um, which is the uh, plant resin that's solidified over time and traps small insects and leaves and things inside it. And uh, David likes fossils, so he was really excited by the idea that we could tell the story of what you could tell about the past from the things that were trapped in amber. It's called the Amber Time Machine. And um, he presented it and, and was in it uh, a lot, you know. So filming with him was just the best thing ever, really, as you can imagine. He's such a nice man. Um, so, yeah, that's my favourite bit. Yeah, that, that's great. Right, well, thank you, um, everybody, for your questions, and um, thank you again, John, for being able to do this sort of live stream for us. It's been an absolute privilege. 
And uh, once again, just because you're so busy as well, um, an even more kind of special thing to do. Um, so thanks once again. Uh, it'd be nice if we could all give um, Josh a just a round of applause. Thank you very much. But I'd just like to say thank you because it's great talking to you, and I think um, you know the future of the environment in your hands. And I would say um, pay attention to climate change, and if you can do anything, um, whatever you think you can do that will help raise awareness about climate change and understanding that, then please do because it is changing the world, and we need to we need to act now about it. So great talking to you, and let's do it again sometime. Yes, will do. Thanks very much, and good luck with your next uh, expedition as well. Thank you. Okay, thanks. Take care. Bye-bye. Bye-bye.